now, right here, and right now, I'm so impressed that uh, all this bus and talking, too much surprise, that people are still talking, as if so many all of you understand the last talk, <laughs> <laughs> the happy weight about Bayesian theorem, <laughs> statistics, top one and top two error, and all that. From my experience of teaching psychology, this, this is the kind of area that most students fear. So I'm delighted that right here, right now, we have an audience of no, no fear. <laughs> <laughs> so now from top one and top two errors, we are into the realms of three mystical states. Yeah? Very exciting. And it's my honor to um, introduce uh, less my friends dear colleagues, uh, of <coughs> Emerit, uh, Emeritus Professor uh, of uh, Transpersonal Psychology at Liverpool John Moore University. And I know, I know less for more than seven years now when I stayed back in 2005 when I was an honorary visiting lecturer at the University uh, of John Moore at Liverpool and engaging with some of the students at Transpersonal Psychology program and I can see some of the familiar faces here. So welcome once again. And I understand that uh, apart from published many books and paper in the areas of consciousness and bringing spirituality to a workplace and, and mindfulness and conscience and so on. Leslie, is uh, also an honorary fellow of the Center of Jewish Studies uh, at the Manchester University and also adjunct faculty of the CIIS, the California Institute of Integrated Studies. So without further ado, a very warm welcome to uh, Professor Lancaster. Um, the, term, the term is emphasizing that in line with classical rabbinic Jewish approaches, the fundamental authority lies with the scriptural text and the, 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 the path to be worked on is that of interpreting and using exegesis, um, interpreting the text. Uh, but having said that, it's not a dry interpretation and when you uh, we we'll get to understand what is going on with these texts, I'll try and in, in, indicate in a second, then it's, it's clear that the experiential life of the mystic is driving the interpretation. It's like there's, there's, there's two, two drivers. One is the scripture itself, with the authority of revelation, and the second has to be the mystic's own experience. So here's a classic text from we call the Midrash, the rabbinic background, going back some 1800 years, something like that. Um, I don't want to analyze it in great detail, but it's a text which indicates that, hyperbolically or otherwise, the process of scriptural interpretation can lead to a, a fiery state. Then as I was sitting and interpreting, and fire was all around him. Rabbi Akiva says, uh, perhaps you were engaged in the inner rooms of the chariot. <coughs> For those who studied any of this line of mysticism, you'll know this is a particular um, uh, term referring to visionary mystical experience <coughs> based in the scripture from Ezekiel. So, so Akim is challenging him and say, okay, well this whole experience with the, the, the fire being around you, uh, that seems to be reflective of you getting into the deepest mystical states. And he says, no, I'm just interpreting, connecting the words of the Torah, and the prophets, and the prophets, the writers. In other words, this is referring to the standard scriptures within the Jewish tradition. Um, but he makes the point that uh, I'm connecting, really, you say, I'm connecting with the revelatory source of these words. In other words, in the tradition, this happened on Mount Sinai, and as he quoting the scripture saying, the mountain was burning with fire. 
So it's a kind of proof text around the, um, what I would say, the experiential quality of profound interpretive states, hermeneutic states. And just I've drawn a couple of uh, scholars, very eminent scholars of, of, of the Kabbalah, um, Daniel Boyer, and said, hermeneutics is a practice of the recovery of vision. <coughs> and Moshe in certain characteristic commentaries of the Bible, we find indications that a prophetic, i.e. fiery or mystical, a prophetic state of mind is believed necessary to the proper decoding of the Bible. In other words, these, these two scholars really are, are, are viewing it in complementary ways. For Boyerin, um, the, the work of exegesis brings the experiential state. Of course, and Adele is saying it the other way around, in the sense that, that you have to have the experiential state in order to prove the Bible that the scriptural text is in the right way. Well, that's an interesting discussion in its own right, which comes first, of course, chicken and egg. All I'm trying to point out here is a, 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 an area which I think has, has, has really been somewhat neglected within the psychological study of, of, of mystical literature, which is the, 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 this experiential quality in the process of exegesis. So I thought I'd, um, I mean this is a huge topic in its own right, but I want to get on to the, the major point I'm getting to. I just thought I'd give one uh, illustration um, of this point about the, the about experiential hermeneutics. Here's, here's a text from the Zohar, which um, classically takes a biblical text, because that's the authority, and is starting to play with it. Uh, how does it play with it? Through the mystery of language. So again, it's a bigger subject than I'm going to hear, um, but again, for anyone who's, who's looked into the Kabbalah, or Sufism, other very similar areas of mysticism, they are really, really mysticisms of language. So very simple point. So um, the Hebrew is very fluid in terms of the way one word can relate to another word, and that's what they're playing with. There's kind of associationism at work. The, the, so um, the, the, the biblical text of God, you know, God, I search for you, Ashacharecha, it's Hebrew. So you can see there's, a, there's an etymological connection with another word, shakha, which means dawn, and shachor, which means back, black, and then another link uh, from another biblical text, uh, who will find me, um uh, And so those are the, again, we can't go deeply into the language, we don't have time, and we want dinner. <laughs> um, but the point I want to make, and if you read this text and you think about it, it's fairly clear that an, an experiential grasp of different states of consciousness drives the way that they make sense of the text. In other words, if we start at the end, always a good place to start. If you start at the end, you'll see that the, 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 as it were, the secret of this exposition is that finding God can only happen to those who enhance the black light of dawn. Now obviously this is codified language. So the links of the black light of dawn, and then earlier it says um, enhancing the, the light shines at dawn, for the light of dawn does not shine until it's enhanced below, and whoever enhances this dawn light, even though it is black, attains the shining white light. And then further. So there's a lot of codified language in here that anyone who's uh, again, certain Kabbalistic ideas, you will, I'm sure, connect with some of those. So this, this idea of the black light, it's not just in Kabbalah, um, in, in very important in Sufism as well. Uh, what is the black light? Well, clearly, the relationship between black and dawn is a difficult time to discern. It's dark, the light is growing. So there's a, there's a physical association very strongly there. But again, if you... Uh, if you understand the, the connection with other texts of Kabbalah, they're talking about different states of consciousness. And there are states that uh, are, this is what the point I'm making, is that the, the understanding the knowledge of the states is, is primary, and putting it into the text is secondary. And it's done so that someone who's now reading, so if you're reading this book, this text, 
it will help you understand something about mystical states. But it's not going to, you're not going to have a mystical experience from reading this. So it's a question of understanding that the, the, the mystical states that the Zohar is describing are not described explicitly. But they are there implicitly. And that's really where I come to the main point. Um, so I'm referring to a recent publication, uh, um, Helen Eshed writing a very, very good work on the Zohar. And she identifies three main states of consciousness. Um, first fundamental point is in the Zohar and the Kabbalah generally, consciousness is seen as the link between the human and divine. Um, three states using the language of the Zohar itself. One is rose consciousness, the next is tree of life consciousness, and the third is white light consciousness. Um, I haven't got time to to substantiate this in relation to all the texts in the Zohar. I just want to claim the authority of Helen Eshin, who was a great scholar and writer in this area. So rose consciousness is characterized by the intensification of the senses. It has an emotional quality, and as I say, the sense, I think ultimately it's, it's, it's a conscious state in which the mystic recognizes that whatever it is they're seeing, be it the physical world, the real, the natural world, or indeed it might be a texture from scripture, whatever it is they're encountering is a, um, it's a, it's a veil. And there's something deeper shining through it. That's the first state of consciousness. Uh, tree of life consciousness um, goes beyond that veil and is characterized by a sense of total knowing. Um, again, there's a uh, few other terms there, and you've already got to see from the back. Um, one of the important points in, in the Kabbalistic tradition is, is that the mystic is actually in a participatory relationship with the Godhead. So the tree of life consciousness, the term that Carl Eschen uses, um, is one in which the mystic is able to actually engage in this theurgic i.e. participatory activity in a sense, uh, correcting the divine, which is an interesting topic in well. White light consciousness, experience of the oneness and the unity of the heart of being, uh, the root of thought. So I want to just, oh, I put a couple of words on here. Uh, rose consciousness, the sense of duality is still strong present. Uh, white light is non-dual. Uh, and uh, the, the tree of life consciousness is the limit. Actually, it's the most interesting being the limit threshold. Uh, for those who know something of the Kabbalah, uh, this might also be useful, but I'm not going to explain all this in detail. The fundamental symbol of the Kabbalah is the tree of life, the tree of the Sirot. If you get here, it would take far too long to explain, but just to make a reference. So, rose consciousness is centered in the lowest. A dimension of that tree, uh, tree of life consciousness, is because the center is the totality, so tree of life consciousness centered in the center, central R, is also the totality, and of course the white light is the, the ultimate in that sense. Parallels. Now there are dangers in parallels, but it seems to me um, that certainly in under, under, even in Underhill's work, we see very clear parallels. That's maybe not so surprising. And in the first place, even in Hunter, and Hill were drawing on the work of Neoplatonists, Christian mystics who also, in the same sense, they, there was a connection with Kabbalah. And in any case, even in Underhill was involved herself in a mystical fraternity, very much influenced by Kabbalistic ideas, the, the hermetic of the Golden Dawn. Um, so it's again, it, 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 it's hardly surprising there's a parallel there. There may be a parallel with Wilbur's ideas. I don't particularly want to uh, go in that. I think there might be some interesting food for thought there. Um, but my main interest, he says, noting that time's passing on, is whether understanding the way in which the 
mind brain is working can cast light for us on our grasp of these states. And I'm going to very quickly present a model that I've written about a great deal and some I've talked about it here in the past and also I've written about it so I'm hoping that many of you at least will have some um, have some background here. Basically one of the things that I'm most interested in um, is the, 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 whole, the, the way that perception is working and how do we understand consciousness in relation to processes in the brain and, 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 um, and, the view, and the idea that understanding perception is not simply a question of seeing uh, vision or any other of the systems but actually the perceptual mechanism is a, a kind of microcosm of mind, of, of mind as a whole. But uh, again, that's going to take us too far afield. As far as the, uh, the perceptual systems are concerned, um, all the systems have these feed forward and re entrant In other words, a highly interactive system, be it vision, be it hearing, or whatever. And uh, to understand that, it's clear that the feed forward, that is, we take vision, neurons going from, uh, from the retina through into the primary areas of the cortex. They're concerned with sensory processing. But in order to, for us to perceive, to be conscious of seeing something, then there has to be some act, activity of pre-conscious memory. In fact, I can link this actually to what Chris was talking about. The whole subject of crime um, demonstrates the role of pre-conscious activation and so on. Uh, but I don't have time to it's, uh, I think we can make that. And uh, again, there's good neurophysiological evidence that in the perceptual process, uh, there has to be a matching process. So the, 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 the sensory processing uh, generates some kind of preliminary sketch or model of what's in front of the eyes or what you're hearing and so on. Um, the pre-conscious search activates something that you may have seen before. And the crucial thing is that there'll be a matching process. And if, it's, if, if it matches, then that's what you see. And finally, very importantly, uh, that, that, that Whatever the results of this sensory and perceptual process, it has to be incorporated in what, to what I call an I narrative. In other words, I am the witness. I am the I, I am the vantage point in which I make sense of everything that's going on in my perceptual field. This is just adding in. Sorry, at the bottom the. Um, um, if you can see at the back, which is some of the, the, the neurocognitive um, features that are relating to what I've just been talking about. So this is the, the, the model I've worked with. Um, so take the example, if you're looking at the pen as a stimulus, then there has to be some sort of sensory coding that takes place. But importantly, and again, this links into the point of that priming, uh, because just to add to what Chris was saying, uh, priming works in an associative way. I mean, you, the, the classic, the, the, the words that you were talking about, uh, you know, nauseating or whatever it is, it's giving an associative framework in which the picture is, is analysed. Um, so there has to be some kind of associative process pre-consciously. And then finally, whatever the result of that, it has to be included in <coughs> this I, this egocentric uh, stage. Again, there's a lot more to say about that and if you're interested Read my books. Um, what I'm interested in here is how this relates to mystical and other states of consciousness. And very briefly, um, it seems clear to me that mystical practices are working to detach from the normal endpoint and shift to these earlier, more normally pre-conscious phases. Um, obviously, if that is the, the goal, the altered state is something about shifting from uh, the normal eye-focused, eye-narrative, eye-consciousness, then there's two ways that can happen. One is by turning down the end, so you attenuate the interpretation, the interpreter, which gives rise to the I narrative, or the practices which augment 
um, the associative process, and this is classically, these two relate to apophatic and cataphatic practices in the mystical tradition. But the question is, and this is where I think we start, ah, I'll back in now. Um, the question is, how do we understand consciousness itself? And it seems very clear to me, and again, uh, I, I need to rush through this a little bit, that to think of consciousness as a monolithic thing doesn't help us. And I've identified a number of different dimensions of consciousness, I would call them, um, on this slide. So our normal everyday state of consciousness is characterized by three qualities. One is phenomenality, sometimes referred to as qualia, if you like the, 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 the essence of experience. Second quality is what I call here intentionality too, which is reality-oriented content. So I'm sitting here and I see lots of faces in front of me, it all makes sense because I'm giving you a paper here. Um, and third is accessibility, and again this is this is well discussed in the relevant literature. So uh, my normal, everyday, eye-centered sense of consciousness has the quality that I can access other material. So I can access my notes, whatever it is. Uh, and the question then comes, and I'm getting there, if, that, if we accept that, and, the, and they're a good I did mention intentionality one. I, I, intentionality has a, got a background in the philosophical literature, uh, referring to the content of consciousness. And the reason why I divide intentionality two and intentionality one, a, a slight reference there to Freud actually, um, is so intentionality one would be more connected with the associations. It's a more symbolic, the content is more symbolic or more fluid. For example, practices of visualization, active imagination, which I'm sure we'll hear about tomorrow, but would fit in there. Um, so, logically speaking, and here's the, the, the nub, as it were, logically speaking, you could think that there would be four states of consciousness. And as I said, it's not just a question of making things fit, although we can discuss that over dinner, or wine, better. Um, it's not a question of just making it fit. Um, my, my choice to identify these different dimensions has nothing to do with, um, with reading mystical states and so on. Uh, that comes very much from the literature in neuroscience and the philosophy of consciousness and so on. So, the, um, obviously, if you think about it, the model would generate a normal state of consciousness and three altered states. Each, in each one, a particular dimension of consciousness will come to the fore. So, for example, uh, you know, the first state is one in which the narrative I, the sense of I as the focus of my conceptual world, is attenuated. It falls away. I need to do drugs or <coughs> spiritual practices, I just have them. Just in the moment, some random phenomenon. Uh, and if all the other dimensions are intact, then would, the, the, the first altered state would be one strongly characterized by intentionality two, which would be seeing an object, in the case of vision, we could talk about sound as well, but just using this example, seeing an object without the normal self commentary that normally contextualizes that. If that were to fall away, then the state of consciousness will be ca characterized by the strong associative mechanism. If that also falls away, there will just be phenomenality. And it's my view that these states do exist. Um, and I'm sure you can see where this is going. Uh, the correspondence, I think, are quite tight. Well, there's always a danger of correspondences that you can make things fit, so by all means challenge me. But uh, the character of the rose consciousness is an intense connection with the sensory world and the emotionality connected with the sensory world. Characteristic of the tree of life consciousness 
is um, this sense of total knowing, which I would argue may arise as a result of being focused in this associative process. Because the associative process is endless. Um, and obviously the white light, I think that would be quite easy to see, but as, as a consequence, when everything else falls away, there is just phenomenality. And that's understood in terms of light. So that's the, the substance of the presentation in terms of thinking about altered states of consciousness, mystical states of consciousness. But like I said, I, I really wanted to contextualize, and maybe I can think of it as a lead into our session this evening. <coughs> is it science? And also, is, uh, am I being crazily reductionistic? Well, on the that, that latter point, um, this model here, it's not reductionistic. I mean, the notion that I have explained consciousness is nonsense. The, 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 the brain processes evolve to reduce consciousness. We have no evidence for that. We've talked to Rupert. Um, and, uh, and also, all I say is that the processes I understand through neurocognitive analysis are involved, but they don't explain. Not only do uh, we can't explain phenomenality, that's certainly the case. Um, uh, and these intentional states. One of the great issues that is never going to talk about emperor's clothes, the whole idea of representationalism within cognitive science. You, know, you say that, oh, this bunch of neurons represents a pen, or whatever it is. There's a huge assumption underlying that. But, okay, I think that's another story. But it's, it's not, the model is not reductive in the sense of uh, saying it's just happening in the brain. But it's using our understanding of cognitive processes in the brain to relate to what these states are, and to instead to give them some kind of reality in psychological terms. Uh, so that would lead me to this last, this last slide then. Um, transversal psychology, it seems to me that what's distinctive, and I, I remember Elliot, Elliot earlier was talking about uh, mindfulness and how it's been kind of taken out of transpersonal psychology, for those who are here for his lecture. Um, there are many areas that we might think of as our, our domain, as transpersonal psychologists, which are increasingly being studied in other branches of psychology, in other disciplines, mindfulness, issues of spirituality, health, and so on. What is distinctive of transpersonal psychology? Well, I would argue, and I've argued in writing, that it's a it's a, a larger subject. I would argue that what's distinctive here is, is our recognition of the authority that lies in spiritual and especially mystical traditions. Uh, you can shoot this down and say, well, does that mean I, you know, I, I believe everything you look like in line and sinker? And the answer to that is, is no. But it does mean the following, and this is a, a quote from an article which I, where I just discussed this whole question about discipline transversal psychology. Whether or not the ontologies perpetuated with the mystical and spiritual traditions are reducible to naturalistic phenomena, ideas drawn from these traditions tend to be incomplete and even misleading if one remains on the outside looking in as well. One needs to engage in order to understand, and that means both holding back from rejecting ontological teachings and embracing key notions of practice. I don't normally quote myself. Seems a bit. There's my eye narrative. <laughs> but I thought I'd put it. I, I expressed what I wanted to express quite clearly in this little extract. So apologies for quoting myself. I think that's about transpersonal psychology as a discipline, uh, and, and well, it's, I think it's worth thinking through further. Um, another implication, which I won't really go into now, but when I was talking about experiential hermeneutics and uh, that whole line of, of how spiritual states, altered states of consciousness, are within the exegesis of scriptural texts, I think that's a very interesting area to pursue, but that's my particular interest. I won't go through that now. But this is the last point, and I'd say kind of trailer for this evening, maybe. Um, the role of science. I do not do empirical research. Um, and it may be that 
the ideas I put there about the different states and the cognitive neuroscientific process involved. Maybe someone can do some research, it'll be great, or we'll get lots of MRI scans or whatever. That's not what I do. What I'm interested in is using models. And it's, I make no apologies for that. If I'm drawing a model in neurocognitive science, it's a model that I believe is strongly empirically supported. And that's, that's, that's the authority from that side. But the fact is, like, for example, in areas of, of, uh, of physics today, high energy physics, uh, much of the work is based in understanding models. Uh, the question of what you can actually demonstrate in terms of in, in, hypothesis testing, that's kind of, excepting the Higgs boson, which is also Higgs boson, right? Uh, a lot of modern physics is more in the nature of model building, M, string theory, M, M theory, those kind of things. So I would say that uh, that's my approach to transversal psychology. Um, and, and it is in the realms of science and therefore it is in the realms of psychology as we understand it. Another aspect, of course, is how we engage with the transformative states themselves, but that's something I won't go into now. So I think it's time to finish, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. fantastic. Yeah, great. Let's <laughs> finish that. Yes, fine. I mean, as long as we don't ruin people's appetite. Hi, Liz. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I just wanted to say that I was really interested in the rose consciousness that you talked about, um, purely because I'm quite interested in the sensory aspects relating to ESP and how to optimise conditions for extra sensory perception. And a little study that I did, which I don't think we really have enough participants to kind of really make any firm conclusions, but I've used sensory synchronisation in a similar sort of way that's been used in the rubber hand illusion, uh, but with, between two participants to kind of optimise empathy and use that to test uh, whether or not they were able to perceive a sense of smell remotely once they've been separated. And I found that although no significant results were found that demonstrated ESP at all, what I did see, uh, what I did find, because it was repeated measures design, was that um, there were significantly worse, uh, significantly worse than chance results um, following empathic um, sensory synchronisation. Um, and actually, it was only in the precognitive condition that that changed and flipped to um, being just more than worse than chance significantly, but it went to just a chance level. So there was a significant difference between the two conditions um, using sensory synchronisation, which in a nutshell is <laughs> not something that we can discuss a lot about now. But what I was interested in was the fact that you were using um, examples of the senses and how that can be um, used to access the divine consciousness. And I just wondered if there was a reverse to that, as opposed to using the senses, but sensory deprivation, what your, what your view is on the opposite side of it? If, that, if that's an answerable question, it's probably isn't. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting, interesting question. question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I could probably have phrased it better. I'm a little bit nervous, so <laughs> I don't apologize. Okay, let me just, uh, I feel like well, keep it brief if I may. But um, I think that, all right, in the context of the Zohar, I'm coming from, Right? In, in, in this presentation, rose, the, the symbol of the rose is associated with what's known as the Shekinah, which is the feminine presence of the divine. Okay? So the whole subject to talk about what, they, what, what is meant in that sense by encountering the, 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 the Shekinah. And the style of the Zohar is a huge work, but one of the, it's all about journey. So you get these, uh, these um, band of, 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 of uh, sages and they're sort of walking, walking in the countryside and something happens. There's a, there's a guy driving a group of horses, you know, sort of, to use a current word, a play. <laughs> and suddenly he starts talking 
and, and he says the most profoundly uh, you know, words of wisdom. So, so the context is that these people, that the, these sages, are kind of in the real world. And what they experience is that the real world opens in ways that they hadn't expected. And I think that relates to the point of par parapsychology. And just to add in what you were saying, um, you know, the Zaha is not talking about sensory deprivation. No, it's not even talking about, it, it, it's just a hook on which I'm looking at this. And I would say, in relation to what you said, what you asked about, that disturbing the senses is a way of accessing that state of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's not what. Well, it's actually, there are some examples of the Zaha that comes in. You know, we talk about that. Uh, well, we'll miss you our first course. Uh, yeah. One more question. Okay, uh, very briefly. I, I just want to take your um, weather introduction. Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, you, you explained very well, and I, I take your point, that an awful lot of this processing, talking about the neuroscience stuff now, is in, is in the area of memory. And, uh, and this loop where it tries to make a match, and it may make a match, and it doesn't make a match, it goes around again and tries to, and so on. Doesn't all that, though, suggest that there is a process that's going on in this very complicated computer of the mind, which I don't dispute, which also, though, leads me, and if I'm a skeptic, leads me to leave out the collective unconscious, the, un the personal unconscious, and also the sort of stuff that Rupert would talk about, you know, in fields completely beyond the mind. It, it leads one in that direction. No, that, I, I would, I would contest that. I would well. contest that. Uh, and, and again, I, I, you know, I've written very much about you know, this model and how I would relate it to issues of the unconscious and, and yes, even the collective unconscious. Um, that, that, in a way, we can leave the model behind. The, the model is not saying that all, the, well, I am not saying that all these activities, now let, let's say we're engaged in some, uh, there's some very interesting Kabbalistic practices in which the mystic is exploring lang letters, language, wheels of wheels of meaning, right? There, there, there's some very interesting, I think I talked about them in, in, in the conference as well. Uh, you know, I am not saying that that is just a process of a certain area of the brain doing whatever it does. I'm not saying that. I'm, I would say that the, that the associative flow, which is there all the time, pre-consciously, is actually our gateway to these larger realms of mind. And the collective unconscious, you know, I don't know what it is. I know what Jung said about it. I know criticisms of Jung about it. But I know that in, a, in my own experience, in some states where I've explored a number of these kinds of practice, I encounter things that are deeply profound. I don't know where they come from. But to me, they're real in the context. I think that might answer the question. Right, uh, thank you so much for that. Now, that is the best doctor I think I've ever had <laughs> for the whole day or year. So now the main course of dinner is served.